All right, do any of you have a question that you absolutely hate to be asked? I do, and it typically comes up in a social setting, typically when I'm meeting people that I don't really know, and often it's after we've been chatting for a while, so we've, you know, we've talked about sports, we've talked about the weather, we've exchanged some witty banter, and then somebody has to go and ruin it all by asking, so what do you do? All right, and no, don't be wrong, I love what I do. I absolutely love what I do. But what I don't love is the response I get when I open up and tell somebody else what I do. But knowing this, I go ahead and answer the question. I'm a mathematician. <laughs> becomes mute. I get this sort of <laughs> look, and maybe they can muster up something like, wow, well, you must be really smart. <laughs> or, I'm kind of intimidated right now. All right, the next person, all the worst, is the one that's not intimidated whatsoever by what I do, and they have no qualms telling me about it. All right, so I get this, I hate math. I've always hated math. I hated all my math teachers, I don't know why I had to take math, Who, when are we ever going to use this stuff, right? And then I get the third sort of unusual response that our little doggy with glasses represents, and the occasional person who almost embarrassingly, not wanting anybody else to hear, says, I actually like math, <laughs> okay? So I'm trying to combat that and this by trying to challenge the way that you think about mathematics. Okay, so that's the goal tonight, but first we have to talk about sports, because I love sports, it's March, so we have to talk about basketball, right? So when I say basketball, what comes to your mind? Probably not this, right? It's, it's completely supposed to be something that you can't really see, um, but if you've been involved in basketball, you know this is an integral part, right? So if you play basketball, or you've known somebody that plays basketball, what do you do more than play games? You go to practice. Yes, right? So we, you go to practice, you do all these crazy drills. You put cones down and you dribble around the cones, you dribble around your legs, you do suicides, you do free throw drills, you do ball handling drills, you play bump or knockout or whatever you call it, which to me seems like a monumental waste of time. Like why in the world would the coaches do this stuff that you're never actually going to use in a game? You see where I'm going with this. Okay, so... My, my claim is there's a purpose behind the drills, behind the repetition, not because there's, can you imagine in the middle of a basketball game, a guy's on a fast break, coming down the court, throws down a bunch of cones, dribbles around them, goes in for the layup, right? Probably not going to happen. But the drills have made the person more comfortable with the basketball. It gets more, it's a natural reaction to the, to the game, right? So probably when I said basketball, he thought of something more like this. Right? We want them to come back. 
And, um, and so they, they realized that they could armor the planes a little bit better. But they also realized we can't armor the whole plane. Okay, because it would then be too heavy. It would probably burn up too much fuel. All right, we can't do that. So we've got to pick and choose where are we going to reinforce this plane? All right, so they collected some information, looked at what parts of the plane were being shot up, right? And, and so they looked at the main three areas, the engine, the fuselage, and the fuel system, and realized it looks like the fuselage was taking the biggest hit. All right, and then the rest of the plane, they looked at that and thought, really, they could hone in on the nose and the wings. Okay, so with that decision being made, they approached the mathematician, Abraham Wald, who was a Jewish mathematician who had escaped from Austria and come to the United States. And they didn't really trust him with a lot of information, okay? But they did take him this and say, what we would like you to do is help us to figure out how to do this optimally. What's the best way for us to add the armor to the fuselage and maybe the wings or something in order to protect the plane? And he said, you've got it all wrong, which we as mathematicians love to say. Right, so he said, you need to armor the engine. You need to armor the place where you don't find the bullet holes. Why is that? Okay, great question. Um, I'm going to have to ask these for you since it's not interactive. So, so they went, and so he, what he explained was, what you're basing your assumptions on is that you're looking at all of the planes. But you're not. The reality is a lot of the planes didn't come back. And so what he saw is the fuselage could get pretty shot up. The rest of the plane could get pretty shot up and it would come back because you're looking at it. The engine, however, could not. And the reason there were fewer bullet holes was one of two reasons. Either the Germans were really bad shots or when the engine got hit, the plane more often went down. So he readjusted their thinking and they went with it and they armored the engine and they did it again in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Okay, so this is mathematical thinking. You've got to challenge your assumptions when you're trying to make a decision. Okay, so what, what am I assuming here as I'm trying to make this decision? This one actually saved lives, right? The rest, not so much. All right, so next, politics. Oh, politics. So this is not really going to solve any problems, but it's going to explain to you why mathematicians know better than to go into politics, or really into any field that has to do with people's public opinion. <laughs> because the problem is we dig ourselves in a hole we can't get out of. It. All right, so... The question might be, how many of you think, you don't have to actually answer this, how many of you think that we should try to cut the deficit? Well, if you ask the American population, they're gonna, the majority are going to say yes. Yes, we should cut the deficit. The deficit's terrible. It's huge. We need to get cut into it. Great. Politicians thinking, great. That's all I think, too. Let's go for it. Second question, how do we do this? We've really got two options, right? We can raise taxes or we can cut spending. Well, most people really don't want their taxes raised. Am I right? So they're like, yes, cut spending. We want to cut spending. We're all on board with that too. Here's the problem. People really like the things that the government spends money on. Okay, so if you try to dig a little deeper and suggest what we should cut, guess what happens? You can't find a majority of people that can agree on any one thing to be cut because they like those programs. They like the things that the government's supporting. This is a little simplistic version of it where I've just got it into thirds. Right? So a third of the people want to raise taxes, a third of the people want to cut defense, a third of the people want to cut Medicare. All right? So the agreement clearly is to cut spending. You've got two thirds of the people that want to cut spending. But then when you decide, okay, we, we, we're going to go with the majority and then we've got to decide what we're going to cut, so let's cut defense. Well, guess what? Two thirds of the people don't want to do that. Right? Well, okay, well, we'll cut Medicare. Well, two thirds of the people don't want to do that either. All right? This is a simplistic version, but it's actually what's happening. Right? So in the previous administration, there was a national agreement to cut the deficit. There was a national agreement to do it by cutting spending. 13 different programs were put forward as what could possibly be cut. And the people voting voted to increase the spending in 11 of those categories. <laughs> so not only did they not vote to cut the spending or keep it the same, they voted to have it go up. And the other two categories that they agreed to cut were such a minuscule part of the budget, they really didn't make any difference. Okay, so here's the problem, right? So it's easy to get a group to agree on an end goal. What it's hard to do is get a group to agree on how to reach that goal. Okay, so you can either be like a mathematician and avoid this altogether, or if you go into a leadership place that, where you really do want to get some public opinion, 
right? Which is probably good. You don't want to be a dictator, or maybe you do, but don't tell me. <laughs> right? So you, you, you want to get public opinion, but you have to be careful. The more you ask, the deeper you dig, the more likely you are to get into a place where now, it doesn't matter what you do, the majority of people are going to be unhappy with you. Okay, so what's going to happen if I decide not to go after the deficit? The majority of the people are unhappy because they wanted us to cut the deficit. If I do decide to cut the deficit, and I should do it through raising taxes. The majority of people are unhappy because they don't want their taxes raised. But if I do it through cutting spending, a majority of people are unhappy because they don't like what I cut. Okay, so at some point in the leadership role, you have to realize this conundrum that you can get into and just make a decision. You have to be the leader. All right. Last one, religion. All right, so I toyed with this one for a while. Some of you probably heard of Pascal's wager. Okay, so this was Pascal, probably heard of him, hopefully at least. Um, and so he mathematically argued that the only logical thing to do was to believe in the God of the Bible. It's kind of a heavy argument, uh, but basically if you don't believe and you're wrong, it's a big penalty, right? So if you do expected value, you're doing better to believe, right? But I thought that might be a little heavy for tonight. So let's go with me sitting in church. Okay, so we sit in church, and we're singing the song, and all the people around me are just amazed by grace. And I'm sitting there amazed at the grasp on infinity that the author of this hymn has. Okay? So let's, let's read this. It says, when we've been there, talking about heaven, 10,000 years, bright and shining as the sun, we've no less days. What? We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So get this, you've arrived at heaven, you've high-fived all your people, you've got the streets of gold, it's a pretty cool place, you're hanging there for days, for weeks, for months, for years, 10,000 years, and you're like, this place is great, I hope I don't have to leave anytime soon. And you realize you've got exactly the amount of same amount of time left as you did when you showed up 10,000 years earlier. If that's not a beautiful picture of infinity, I don't know what is. Right? So, so we've looked at these examples of, of how mathematics can save lives, or how it can just make you understand how you're in a hole you can't get out of, or just appreciate something, or just be weird. Okay, and go, this just scratches the surface. All right? But my goal here is to get you to realize that mathematics, the drill, leads to the ability to think mathematically. Okay, so we're going to look at the basketball clip one more time, but we're going to do that in a minute, because I can't leave without counting, all right? So we have to count. We're going to count all the way to three, all right? One is that you're all mathematical thinkers. All of you are mathematical thinkers. You've been entirely too exposed to mathematics in your life not to be. Now, we're all along a spectrum, right? So we're not all at the Abraham wall to save lives end of the mathematical thinking spectrum, right? But anytime you can sit down with a group of your friends, pull out a game you've never played before, read the instructions, and actually play the game, you're thinking mathematically, okay? And you might think, well, that just comes naturally. Well, that's because you've learned and been exposed to the way you have to think to do mathematics, right? Or you may, if you can just have the thought that, hey, just because something's good doesn't mean that more is better. That's mathematical thinking, okay? So we're all mathematical thinkers. Number two, it's okay that we're not all in the same place on the spectrum. So I just argued that it was hard to get agreement. But I think we could probably all agree that we don't really want a world filled with all the people that are really strong mathematical thinkers. Okay, so they bring a good perspective, but it's one perspective. All right, so wherever you are on the spectrum, just appreciate it. And number three, for the love, don't be the hater. Right? <laughs> when you meet, don't be number two, right? When you meet somebody at the party, or wherever you are, and they tell you they're a mathematician, or they've majored in math, or something along those horrible lines. <laughs> All right, stop yourself before you give your knee-jerk reaction to tell the person how much you hate it. And stop for a minute, take a breath, back up, and think about the fact that if there's anything, this goes beyond mathematics, if there's anything that somebody loves, right, that they're passionate about, that they find beauty in, there's probably something there even if you don't see it. So rather than telling them how much you hate it and bringing your perspective, maybe just say, wow, that's fantastic. Tell me about it. What do you like? What do you think you want to do with that? Okay, so you be that person. So we're going to look at the basketball clip. We've gone way too long without talking about basketball. So we're going to go back to that same clip I showed you. I want you to think about the whole arena. So the setup here, this was the championship last year. 
It's Villanova, North Carolina, they're tied. There's 4.7 seconds left. Villanova has the ball. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, there's only 10 people at that moment playing basketball. But there's thousands of people there, right? And they're at all different levels of basketball ability and basketball understanding. And yet, they can all appreciate what's happening here, right? What's happening in, well, not the North Carolina fans, but everybody else. <laughs> they completely appreciate what's happening here, whether or not they actually have the ability to execute, right? So next time you find out somebody's in that competition, instead of throwing shade, throw a confetti. 